Uh, greetings, my name is Alex Desherbenen, and I want to welcome you to this 27th cyber seminar of the Population Environment Research Network, also known as PERN. Uh, I serve as co-coordinator of PERN along with Dr. Susanna Adamo. Uh, we're simply delighted to welcome back Dr. Wolfgang Lutz, who is the lead organizer of this cyber seminar. Uh, Dr. Lutz founded PERN in the year 2000 at the time he was Secretary General of the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population. PERN's mission is to facilitate scientific analysis and dialogue about population environment relationships. It is an internet-based network that is open and free to all who are interested in population environment research. PERN's activities include maintaining an e-library of population environment literature, hosting cyber seminars such as this one that starts this week, and the periodic What's New bulletins with job announcements and other news for the community. PERN has more than 2,000 members from around the world and representing many different disciplines, and we welcome you to become part of the large and growing PERN family. PERN is, uh, if you go to the next slide, please, Wolfgang. Uh, PERN is hosted by the Center for International Earth Science Information Network. Uh, next slide, please. If you click yes, on the slide first, okay. there you go. There you go. <laughs> PERN is hosted by the Center for International Earth Science Information Network at the Columbia Climate School with funding from the NASA Socioeconomic Data and Application Center, or CDAC. We are a scientific panel of IUSSP and a sustained partner of Future Earth. This webinar and the online si seminar or cyber seminar that follows over the course of this week is co-organized jointly with the WIT Wittgenstein Center. And you can read more about the Wittgenstein Center, and I'm mispronouncing that horribly, I apologize for that, uh, in the information at the bottom of this screen. Next slide, please. So here are a few reminders and ground rules for today's webinar. Uh, first of all, please keep your uh, mic muted unless you are a presenter. If you have a question, please post it in the chat box to everyone or specifically to Catherine Grace, who is going to moderate the discussion at the end of the cyber, uh, this webinar. Uh, and please reference the specific presenter and topic so that we can be sure to have the right person answer your question or engage with your, your question. Uh, the cyber seminar which follows this webinar will take place from today through next Monday. And you're welcome to join that cyber seminar by sending an email to PERN seminars plus subscribe, or you can follow uh, the other instructions on the web page. If you wish to post a message, send it to PERN seminars at season.columbia.edu. Anyone is welcome to post messages to the cyber seminar or interact with the panelists on this discussion list. The list is moderated, which means your post will not appear immediately, um, and especially in the middle of the night in the US. Uh, with that, I'd like to welcome um, and hand over the reins to Pern's former chair of the scientific committee, Raya Mutarek, who is at IASA and who will introduce the program and today's speakers. Over to you, Raya, thank you. Thanks so much, Alex. I just want to say a few words about Pern Seminar because we have done this uh, webinar and cyber seminar ways before the COVID time. So in a sense, we, we have pioneered already this, this format and it, it has worked uh, quite well. And then just want to emphasize what Alex said. So in the course of this week, there would be um, the discussion paper also that we would post around this topic of, of the seminar itself. So I hope to see also the lively discussion there. Um, so we sort of uh, setting up this, this seminar on demography of sustainable human well-being. It's uh, based on sort of the philosophical question that we have. So because we want to know if there is a universal indicator to measure human well-being. And the idea of hosting this debate and the PERN because of the close reciprocal relationship between the well-being of the human of course, the health of the planet and also the link uh, interactions across interactions so with economic development. So we hope to, to generate this discussion around this topic, what are the fundamental 
elements to include in the indicator of human well-being and, and it's a chat by everyone um, in the world or not um, so and also yeah I forgot to mention that the, the sponsor one sponsor a big sponsor also of this seminar it's also because Wolfgang got the, the the big European grant called uh, from the European Commission called ESC grant so that is also part of, of this project and with this I would start we, we tied the time so I start handing over straight away to to Wolfgang who would talk about his project and his indicator that indicated that he invented well uh, good afternoon or good morning or depending where you are um, yeah, my name is Wolfgang Lutz and it's a pleasure that uh, you uh, discuss with us today something which is a, a very important but equally difficult topic because it has so many uh, dimensions uh, it is my ERC grant entitled the demography of sustainable human well-being uh, that has as its first component and very important component uh, to try to come up with a quantitative well-being indicator that should be uh, widely acceptable uh, as a sort of we all agree that this is something we are aiming for and that can also serve as a sustainability criteria you know that there are 17 sustainable development goals with 169 more specific targets and then there are at least uh, 210 official SDG indicators. Some countries have a big, much bigger sets. And I mean, there is just lots and lots of data. Some of them are different points in time and some of them are improving, others are deteriorating. So it's really difficult to see the big picture, see the forest and not only the individual trees. So this was the motivation since I've also been a part of the a group of 15 uh, external scientists to, to, to write the Global Sustainable Development Report 2019 and together with uh, David Smith who is also going to talk soon and uh, there was really sort of the need to, to draw the big picture. So uh, I came to the conclusion that it would be desirable to have one widely acceptable indicator that could help to assess progress and can be forecast into the future while also at the same time reflecting the possible impacts of environmental change and other future changes on future human well being. And do so also for subpopulations like men and women separately and not just the national populations. Uh, you've been uh, received a link to this article last year in PNAS that uh, tries to introduce this indicator. As you know, there's a huge array of uh, different uh, well being measures by many different institutions. We have at the center there, you see the Human Development Index being uh, the oldest and uh, probably uh, most well known. There's the Happy Planet Index, there's an OECD Better uh, Life Index, and, and, and many others. Actually, in the appendix of this paper, we review 31 different indicators. Not to say that there aren't many more, but we just tried to capture the, uh, the most prominent ones and uh, uh, cite like what is the, the scientific basis, the theoretical foundations, and then what are the different uh, components of this. So we don't have time to go into this. Rather, I want to put a step back and so what should such a well-being indicator be able to do? Uh, you may have heard of this uh, rather new field of sustainability science uh, that tries to bring uh, the uh, concern about sustainable development uh, into a rigorous scientific framework. And, and there one key uh, approach here is what is maybe also called the well-being production function. You see like W, the well-being of a certain population or subpopulation at time T is a function of a set of capitals, C, and they capital stocks, they are manufactured capital, human capital, natural capital, but then institutions matter, the laws, rules, norms, expectations, and knowledge. So there is a whole array of determinants of human well-being. And uh, in sustainability science, so much so far, there has been a lot of research on the concept of inclusive wealth. Uh, actually, Partadas Gupta, uh, one of the fathers of this, will soon be speaking after me on this very topic. But there has been rather little work addressing W directly trying to measure W and that's what we try to do here. So we started out defining a set of um, six criteria for a well-being indicator. First, uh, it is uh, 
of course, necessary to have uh, something that is universally or as broadly as possible shared among people with very different backgrounds as an ultimate end. You see these five people here. I mean, we, they have very different backgrounds, as you see, but they, they may be uh, having sort of similar goals or appreciate similar things as being uh, the ultimate end uh, for sustainable development. That's one of the challenges that we're also going to uh, discuss today whether this is at all possible, and if so, what uh, would be the best ways of approaching this. Secondly, it also needs to be based on characteristic of individuals that can be flexibly aggregated to subpopulations. Uh, as I said, men and women, it could be uh, ethnic minorities, it could be any sort of uh, subpopulation. Uh, uh, but national accounting is not good enough for this because national accounting only can give you sort of the average uh, GDP per person for a, a national economy. So this does not allow you uh, to differentiate by subpopulations. So that's why uh, we really want to focus on individual characteristics. And then, of course, it needs to be comparable over time and across subpopulations so that you can compare it and, and, and rank it. Uh, it should as much as possible be theory-based and not include implicit trade-off assumptions uh, or uh, arbitrarily weighting schemes. Like many of these indicators, they give every aspect either weight, equal weight or different weights. So or like with the OECD index, you, the user can assign the weights uh, he, he or she wants to give to the different aspects. So um, yeah, th this at least needs to be explicitly addressed. And then we need to have uh, sufficient empirical information for different subpopulations and different points in time uh, to actually come up with data for empirical analysis. So this can be the dependent variable, for instance, in some panel regressions. And finally, optionally, it would be nice to have a substantive interpretation in terms of some real life analogy, like the years of life uh, lived in, in good health or something like this rather than just being an abstract index, like uh, the well-being of this population is 0 0.87. Well, we don't know what it really means. So it would be nice to have a, some real world analogy. Okay, let me just come to the heart of the matter. Uh, so we have, we consider uh, survival and the length of human life to be uh, the basic prerequisite for enjoying any quality of life. It seems evident uh, but actually, uh, there are many indicators that don't have length of life explicitly in there. And then the question is, yes, we, we count the years of life, but mere survival is not good enough for most people. We want to see, survive in a certain good condition. And now we have the, the community really divided in some researchers who focus on the objective indicators and others who focus on subjective indicators. And this is really a divided community. You have to choose to either go for the one or for the other. And uh, our challenge was to come up with some sort of a hybrid that brings these both uh, together. So we have three objective conditions like being out of poverty, being free from physical and cognitive limitations. And then we have uh, subjective life satisfaction as the subjective indicator. And you have to be above minimum levels in each of these four indicators in order to count a year of life as a year of good life. How to calculate this? Well, we go to the uh, regular life table where you have, if you're a demographer familiar with this, the big L I column is the person years lived and you multiply this uh, with the proportion that meets all these four, four criteria, it's PI here. And then in the end, you not only get sort of the overall life expectancy, but you also get life expectancy uh, in a good state or in the sort of years of good life uh, as we defined it. Uh, now there are just uh, different applications we show here are three developing countries where we have change over time and you we break it down now into the constituents. You see the, the blue line at the bottom, that's the yogurt, for instance, for Indian women at the age of 20, we start typically to assess it at the age of 20 because for children, it's hard to uh, ask for a life satisfaction. It increases a bit from 15 to 23 years. It's a very low level, partly because the, the, the cognition hasn't improved much. Overall life expectancy has slightly improved from 51 to 54. 
Uh, and then you, you see sort of the life satisfaction has also improved to a certain degree. Health has improved less. So if you are, you need to be above all these uh, four thresholds in order to be then considered uh, for yoga. And that's why the blue line is always the lowest. Now in Mexico, we've seen at the higher level, some progress in most, but more so in uh, being out of poverty, less so on the cognition and the health side. And in South Africa, it's interesting. Also, overall yoga has increased, uh, but life expectancy has somewhat decreased, mostly due to the AIDS pandemic, uh, where life expectancy had stalled or increased to some decrease, uh, whereas many of the other indicators have improved. So overall, uh, the uh, years of good life for women in South Africa over this time period have increased by five years. We can also have more detailed data for, for European countries from the share, the survey of elderly above age 50. And here we break it also down uh, by uh, three levels of education. We see that almost universally, the more be better educated men and women have uh, a higher number of, of years of good life as well as a higher life expectancy. So the, the shaded area in the background is total life expectancy and the solid is the years of good life. And you see the difference between the two is smaller in the Nordic countries and much bigger, for instance, in Italy or in Estonia. Well, time One is minute, running and I'm wrapping up. There is, uh, we did this also for long time series uh, for Finland here. You see in the end, they're not fully converging because in an aging society, there always is the health and disability issue of elderly people. So the, the years of healthy life expectancy will never be at the same level as life expectancy. And here we've reconstructed it uh, with some colleagues uh, here for all countries in the world. So the big challenges ahead now, and this is my last slide, is to estimate empirically sort of a well-being function, uh, where it's important to distinguish between the constituents of well-being, which we just discussed, and the determinant. Education is a specific case, but because it, uh, schooling is a determinant, but the resulting cognitive health is a constituent. And now the biggest challenge of all is to look into the future and somehow operationalize the feedbacks from environmental change uh, to uh, human well-being in the future on top of all the other changes. Okay, I'll stop here now, stop yep. sharing. So I, I start straight away <laughs> with the interview, actually, because Professor Pata the Skupta cannot join us. So Ayu can, can start sharing why I am talking, um, because uh, he cannot join us. But we have the interview of uh, roughly 12 minutes. Uh, and uh, so, yes, so it's going to start. You can start now, yeah. This um, uh, production function of well-being, as it's sometimes called, where you have the, the W, the human well-being for a specific population. It can even be a subpopulation of women or men or any ethnic group, so it doesn't have to be uh, the entire national population on the left-hand side. And this being a function of a set of uh, capitals, uh, it's the, uh, the stocks of uh, manufactured capital, human capital, natural capital, but then also institutions such as laws and the rules of the yeah, norms, expectations and knowledge, scientific knowledge, importantly. Uh, so you are yourself an outstanding authority on the, on the concept of uh, inclusive wealth and uh, natural capital. And, and you also wrote about how you can sort of infer likely changes in future human well-being from changes in this uh, sort of what's happening on the left on the right hand side of this equation so you want to share with us uh, your thoughts about this well thank you very much it's a pleasure to be with you yes you've, you've got a very fine uh, equation there that captures pretty much everything uh, that needs to be captured uh, except for one thing which i think perhaps we underestimate which is the effect of the past on current well-being and now in some sense, you might think that it could be incorporated in the capital assets that we inherit from the past, but that would be not quite correct because you need to know how that capital asset had been accumulated. Habits matter, expectations are determined by our past experience. So now that makes it more complicated, obviously, but I'm just mentioning it as a reminder that when United Nations agencies create well-being indicators, they often overlook that fact, the fact that the past matters. 
Um, okay. The equation you have of well-being on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, the objects of society which affect well-being or create well-being or determine well-being on the right-hand side is correct, but it is contemporary with well-being you're measuring, well-being at date T, okay? And the key thing in sustainability analysis, in my judgment, is to bring the future and future people and future well-beings directly into the calculus. Mm -hmm. So we should be thinking of an aggregate measure of well-being, social, societal well-being, which will be aggregating over from T onwards as well, not just T, T plus one, T plus two, and so forth. Now, the standard method economists use is to add it at the sequence. It's a utilitarian calculus, if you like, quote unquote, although it's not strictly utilitarian, it's just an additive form, maybe with a discount rate, but I'll, I'll ignore that for the moment. And that there is a big, the sustainability analysis, one way of defining it would be to say that we should be thinking of pursuing an economic program, which enables society to have an increasing or at least non-decreasing time flow of intergenerational wealth, this aggregate, yeah. not just today's, but tomorrow's as well. Okay. And the theorem about well-being and wealth is that there exists, you give, you give me a notion of an aggregate well-being over time, across the generations, as I've just discussed, maybe summation, and I'll give you a measure of wealth that is a social societal value of the three types of capital assets you have underlined in your in your in your uh, chart produce capital human capital and natural capital such that that index let me call it inclusive wealth because it in, is inclusive of natural capital um, such that if inclusive wealth increases over time any period of time then human well-being across the generation increases as well. And if it declines over time, then so does human well-being across the generation. That's the justification for inclusive wealth. Now, in doing so, uh, of course, you need to have uh, uh, the coefficients, like what are the relative weights of the different capitals? And it seems to me that this can best be assessed if you actually have a quantitative indicator on the left-hand side, so that at least for past time series or so, you can estimate what is the relative role of uh, human capital, natural capital, and the other factors in uh, creating human well-being. So do you think we can sort of uh, deal with this issue about the future without having sort of a, a numerical indicator of W? Or, uh, it's a very, very point. good question. And I think you're exactly on the right track. In my judgment, this is a preliminary a prelude to any notion of looking into the future in sustainability analysis, because you need to have a forecast, a projection into the future. Now, the equivalence that I mentioned between collective well-being across the generations and inclusive wealth, all of that presupposes that there is a forecast. Otherwise, of course, you can't do anything. Yeah. So yours is exactly right. I think they have to do that. So you, what you're suggesting is, let's look at the um, instantaneous, or if you like, a temporal, contemporary well-being, and look at the two sides of the equation, maybe a linear version of it, that's fine. And what else can you do? And then try and estimate it. And you could do that by maybe doing it cross-national comparison, using cross-national data, or you could do it with time series data, I guess. I mean, there are many ways of handling that problem, but that's exactly right, I think, because once you do that, it enables you to start making forecasts some notion of what lies ahead and what policy changes will create what kind of difference yeah. in the future. And then you work backwards to use the inclusive wealth. That's, I, I think you're exactly on the right track on this. Well, thank you. This is uh, reassuring to know. And actually our first attempts to estimate uh, such equation on the basis of past time series, it works quite well for the human capital and also for the economic capital. Uh, what is more difficult is like stocks like uh, biodiversity or some natural capital that is not yet really reflected much in the well-being of uh, of the current generation that may be a threat for future well-being 
uh, it's only in terms of sort of subjective uh, appreciation of the environment where you see some decline in uh, subjective well-being now if people are unhappy about uh, certain <clears throat> species disappearing uh, but the big danger of course lies with discontinuities uh, in, in the yeah the eco uh, systems and the life support systems for humans uh, do you have a sort of a clue how we could try to incorporate let's say this uh, future loss in biodiversity as influencing uh, the specific indicators of human well-being well uh, two observations. I don't have really any satisfactory answer because you're asking a very deep question and a very difficult question. And one reason it's difficult is not because it's intrinsically more difficult than many of the things that you and I work on. It's more that very few people have done any work on it. Yeah. So we have a very small capital base, if you like, you know, intellectual capital base yeah. for the lots of questions. It should have been done a long time ago. It hasn't been done. So it's terrific that you do it. What is the, the more important aspect of human well-being? How people perceive it themselves, this is the whole subjective approach, and the other is in terms of objective indicators. Uh, for objective, there's a much longer tradition, like from the Human Development Index uh, to many other attempts uh, to measure it on, on healthy life expectancy or whatever things that are measured. But then there is a quite powerful and po possibly even more powerful increasingly community on, on this subjective well-being. Let me just cite my Richard Easterlin, who happened to be uh, my teacher in population economics at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he's still active these days in his 90s. And I've sent him a draft of this PNAS paper, paper on the years of good life, asking him for comments. And he just wrote, Wolfgang, I will only positively comment on things that are strictly subjective. I do not accept any objective indicators anymore. Well, that's uh, maybe more extreme at uh, this age, but this is one school of thinking and others uh, deeply distrust any subjective indicators saying that they, you may feel like this in the morning and feel differently in the evening and so on. So what's your take on, on this uh, divide of uh, measuring? Well, I guess I'm, I'm a bit of a conciliator on this. I think both are very relevant. And the reason I think and feel positive about thinking that they're both relevant is that in some deep sense, we academics like to create problems when they may not be that important, which is the following, that all the literature that I've read on the subjective one, and I have read quite a bit, by the way, my review goes into it at great length on yeah. the reports on the subjective evaluation. Um, and the objective, obviously, because those are the ones which governments like to use because it's neutral, they feel it's scientific and, uh, and so forth. Okay, so there's, uh, there's all that. The two seem to work, go very well together. And I think it is mistake, real mistake to ignore subjective. Because at the end of the day, that's what we feel that each of us feels it. And to say that the objective are more objective than the subjective is it's there is an element of um, in my um, exaggeration there, because after all, we empathize with other people. If I feel unhappy, if somebody says he's he or she is feeling unhappy, it's not a meaningless sentence to you or me. I, we understand it, especially if we know the person, then we know what kind of situation she might be in, which leads her to feel unhappy. So I think subjective are extremely important and we should take that into account. And here's one final reason why. Second, I'm convinced now that to ignore subjective is really bad experience, which is relative consumption. Yeah. And Easterling is, of course, one of the found, you know, the Easterling paradox was, uh, you know, it's Easter, famous for that. Your teacher was, uh, was instrumental in setting that. Now, how are you going to get that kind of insight if you looked at only objective? You would be saying, oh, today we are, you know, it, we live longer, we are better fed, we earn more or we give it more income and so forth. So we must be better off. Yeah. Well, the subjective, that is to say, if relative consumption matters, then it could be that we are no better off. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this uh, interview uh, had to be cut a little because we are short of time, uh, but you can see on YouTube the full 35 minute interview. So if I'm not mistaken, uh, Jeff Sachs could join us in the meantime. Yes, here I see you. Hi, Welcome well, and thank you so much for taking the time. It's great to have you on board. 
And um, I mean, uh, it, it's hard to think of anybody more appropriate for this topic because you are in a way uh, the person uh, having dealt with sustainable development, both in, in the scientific as well as in the political UN arena. And you've also extensively dealt with the issue of indicators of well-being, both the objective and the subjective, in particular the World Happiness Report and these things. So we uh, would be delighted if you could share in, in the few minutes that you have with us some of your views on like what's the relative merit of objective versus subjective and what you think about our attempt to sort of do constructing a hybrid that uh, weights the sort of the human years of life with being above minimal levels for both the objective and the subjective. So the floor is yours. Great. Well, first of all, uh, congratulations. This is a wonderful, wonderful work. Uh, it's, it's really in a great direction. It's very useful, very creative. So I support it. Uh, I Secondly, I support the combination of indicators, uh, objective, subjective, and demographic. I think you have the three parts here that are really good. Uh, and I really like uh, the uh, expected years of uh, life satisfaction as being part of this. Of course, there are many issues and challenges on specifics. Uh, but I think what you are doing is very useful. We need more indicators. This is a very important contribution. So let me start with that. Uh, the, there are big problems with all indicators. Uh, and that's why I think it's a mistake to hone in on any single indicator. Uh, I like very much the subjective well-being, uh, and that is the basis of the World Happiness Report each year. The Cantrill Ladder uh, scores that are collected by Gallup from 150 countries. So we have a database now that is uh, around 20 years old for a large number of countries. We report that each year. We'll report that again in just a few days, actually, uh, this week, in fact. Um, and so this is a, a very valid uh, measure, which has deep roots philosophically. I'd say it goes back to eudaimonia uh, and the concepts of a self-evaluation of a good life uh, to ancient uh, Greece to my favorite philosopher, Aristotle. So I, I think that the subjective well-being is definitely valuable. It has problems though, which I'll come to in just a moment. The objective indicators, I also uh, very much subscribe to. And the world has expressed a value judgment on this, which I think you can note. Uh, and that is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is not only our sense of basic needs. It is a global agreement of the needs that attend to human dignity. And so in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and a vast body of covenants and international human rights law that follows this, there is identified the basics of what is needed for one sense of a good life, a life lived in human dignity. And that includes access to a, a viable income, social protection, uh, uh, health, education, and so on. It's been instantiated by things like the uh, multidimensional poverty index, but I think a universal declaration of human rights index would be just fine, actually. Also, we don't have the data at hand uh, other than at national averages, not for households. But the idea of asking to what extent can people meet their basic needs is absolutely valid. I like it, including together with subjective well being. One could argue, uh, I think uh, my colleague Richard Layard would argue, that subjective well being already incorporates that because people who don't have their basic needs fulfilled score very low on SWB, which they do. But I like it having alongside, frankly. I just want to be sure uh, that we're picking up this uh, issue uh, at, at the uh, bottom. I wasn't sure why you gave a 
binary measure to the subjective well-being. I'd like to urge you to uh, try to keep uh, a scale rather than a zero and one. There's lots of information in the scale uh, and lots of fine-tuned differences across countries that are really worthy of measurement and that will change over time and that are the, uh, the grist of the mill for analytics. So I'd like you to keep the zero to 10 scale rather than turning it into a threshold and a step function. Uh, and I uh, wasn't quite sure why you chose that uh, to do it the way you did, but I would urge you to go back to the 10 scale uh, and see what it looks like on that basis as well. I think we'll get, we, I think we lose information putting it through your step function filter without a need to lose that information. I really like uh, the idea of adding in the demographics. Uh, this is missing from all of our normal GDP accounts or static accounts. Um, of course, again, you could say, well, subjective well-being takes into account that lifespans are short and people are worried about that, but I think it's fine to add in this sense, especially if the question is asked, how is your life now? Uh, and, and we elicit the kinds of information that we would like to elicit about subjective well-being. Let me add one uh, caution, which to my mind isn't a caution, it's just a legitimate ongoing philosophical and research issue. I held a meeting uh, last week, actually, at the Vatican where we brought in cultural anthropologists and cultural psychologists uh, to talk about subjective well-being measures. And they were putting a lot of emphasis on the fact that SWB doesn't mean the same thing across cultures. So asking the Cantrell ladder is itself a, a very interesting <laughs> problem uh, of how you assess across cultures. Both, of course, the constituents of happiness are different, that's one thing, and the reported evaluations are different. There's evidence uh, from uh, our Japanese colleagues that Japanese respondents don't want to answer 10. That's impolite. Uh, they want to answer seven. Uh, don't stick out so much. Uh, don't, uh, don't, don't gloat, whereas an American wants to say, I am at a 10, my life is great. Uh, and so there are cultural differences in uh, both the responses, but also, of course, significantly in what constitutes SWB. So that's a different matter, uh, because maybe if the scale were true, you wouldn't care so much about the constituents, but the, the, the cultural psychologists emphasized uh, very individualistic cultures versus collective cultures, whereas we're in well-being in a collective culture really is a lot more about the harmony or the collective sense rather than the individual sense. How one would or would not incorporate this is not so simple and clear, uh, even conceptually, whether you still have an outcome which can be compared across countries or whether you wanna measure different things. In general, I'm in favor of last, asking lots of different questions and learning lots of nuances. So I don't want to think I understand what it means when someone answers a seven on the same scale in different cultures. But just to say that the meaning of SWB, both as a, a, a cardinal scale and of course the constituent components of it differ. Suffice it to say though, you're very much on the right track because we're at a, as you know very well, we're at a primitive state where most of what we measure is GDP per capita, which is by every measure, a completely awful indicator of anything. And so all steps in the favorable direction to measuring what constitutes a good life for people is a measure in the right direction for ethics and for public policy. Uh, 
I think a last point is a lot of our work in the World Happiness Report is about explaining the left-hand side variable, not only reporting it. And there, it is extremely interesting what does constitute a good life. Of course, this is literally the question that Aristotle asked in the Nicomachean Ethics uh, in, in 350 BC. I think he gave about the best answer that's ever been given. But in any event, uh, it is about material conditions. It is about health conditions. It is about social relations and friendship. It is about living in a good political environment. It is about the virtues of the individuals themselves in terms of their own values. So John Helliwell does our panel analysis each year. He has a multi factor explanation of SWB, which includes those factors, GDP per capita, healthy life years, social support, uh, generosity indicator, confidence in government, sense of personal freedom to make individual life choices. Those are the main elements as right-hand side explanatory variables. And I think we should keep the constituent components in mind as well. So that's my, my take. Keep going. This is great. Thank you very much for this most uh, helpful and uh, interesting comments. Just one short remark. I, I, I entirely agree with all you said, but uh, the, these cultural differences were exactly one of the reasons why we chose to go for a binary variable, because uh, there are maybe cultural differences, whether you people and the five, six, or seven on this scale, but whether they feel very miserable or they feel very satisfied, there is a clearer bifurcation that it's an attempt to possibly do this. And the other, of course, is that we really have the aspiration of going into the future to take this as an outcome variable of models that try to capture the impact of climate change, biodiversity loss in the future. And then, of course, you can't deal with very multiple and very sophisticated indicators. You need to sort of have one target number and that also speaks for some simplifications. But of course, as you said, simplifications are always a problem. Well, let, let me say, I, I understand the motivation, but I think it's throwing out too much information to go binary. Uh, there, there's really a lot of information, and it's fascinating, actually, to look at the differences, say, within the OECD countries or uh, to look at changes over time. And I, I just wouldn't filter it that way. I would rather you keep the data and then uh, maybe make some uh, cautionary assumptions or tests or changing the scale in some way, not so, not so brutal. Okay, very, very well taken. Raya, you wanna maybe get some uh, questions yeah, from the Jeff, audience? Jeff, Jeff is still with us until 10.50, right? So- that, That's has... right, yeah, I have five minutes yeah. and then I'm hosting another exactly. Zoom moment. <laughs> so, yeah. so if anyone want to ask questions, please, please do so now. anyone yet maybe i ask quick when um yeah i I've, i'm thinking a lot actually how when if you really want to account for the cultural differences and of course we can try to weight the the, the pattern of answering by country or can we think of grouping at least by region because it makes it easier also to to do the analysis and prediction it, it's not correct to do it by i don't know sub were region, but you know, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think that we should convene a group. I mean, we did it last week for a wonderful discussion, but I think more systematically, there actually is a group of global experts on this issue that are very interesting. Uh, in general, there are regional differences that are notable. Uh, in Latin America, the happiness scores are higher uh, than otherwise explainable by right-hand side variables. So there is a regional phenomenon. In East Asia, I would say lower in general. Uh, and uh, whether that is a response to surveys, a sense of what is the right answer, quote unquote, to a survey question or a meaningful difference can be teased out by other kinds of questions. And uh, 
one of the questions was actually asking Japanese respondents, what should you answer? Or what would be your best answer? <laughs> you know, to even after being told that 10 is the best. And the answer was seven. I don't remember exactly how it was put, but Japanese respondents did not want to answer 10, period. It was just not polite. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't socially uh, know, yeah. appropriate. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. I have a question from Alex. Um, how might uh, years of good life indicator related to the SDG policies and program? It's quite a difficult one, but yeah. I think the purpose of this index is exactly right, which is that we, in any event, need in the 21st century to shift our attention from a, a 20th century economic planning number, which was GDP, to a 21st century quality of life number. We need to do it because the divergence between income and well-being has grown so large because the marginal utility of increased income is very low and possibly uh, negative at this point in the rich countries because uh, we need normatively what we measure will also help us to train to think not just to guide policy, but to help people to rethink their values, because we also shouldn't take as given our values. Our values are also social constructs. The values themselves change over time. We are able to discern a deeper meaning to life than income, perhaps. Uh, once we're told, wake up, open your eyes, you're rich enough, but you're wrecking, the, you're wrecking nature. So I think that this program is important. It is, again, I'm going to say it again, third time, Aristotle started this program when he combined the Nicomachean ethics and the politics, because it's two books that are literally, well, they are a, a pair, and he ends the Nicomachean ethics by saying, now we turn to the politics, because the idea was first to find well-being, and then second, do something about it. And what he urged to do in Athens was raise young people in an appropriate way, cultivate virtue, cultivate good citizenship, and so forth. And so I think we also need to be in the business of understanding what is good in life, and then cultivating the right attitudes and approaches. This is not how modern economics views things, which modern economics says your tastes are given and no one should butt in with your tastes. But this is a very strange view of human life in we are so culture bound, we should reflect on whether our cultures are functional for our deeper needs as human beings. And the answer is right now, no, uh, not, not very much. So um, in this sense, I think this is very much part of the agenda. We, I wrote a paper a couple of years ago with uh, Yana Manuel Denev, uh, my uh, colleague and co-editor uh, of the World Happiness Report, showing that there's a very strong correlation between SDG achievement and subjective well-being scores across countries. They're not unrelated. We didn't get to the depth of that relationship. Uh, we showed, uh, by the way, that environmental goals matter a lot more for high-income countries and, and so forth. But the agenda, I believe, of, of uh, sustainable development, which I count as meaning economic development, social justice, and environmental sustainability. I do regard that prescriptively as an agenda of human well-being also. Uh, so I don't find those intention at all. I, find, I predict from an analytical point of view that if we achieve the SDGs and the Paris Agreement, we're going to promote uh, your score. That's the point, that <laughs> we're going to have a higher quality of life as you measure it. So I'm looking forward to that. And I think you would show that statistically, that achievement of the SDGs will be uh, actually uh, raising the index that you propose. Yeah, and I also think one achievement of SDG for all, I think that's also very important, isn't it? One side is in tackling the inequalities. Yeah. 
Um, Jeff, did you have to go or? I do have to go actually. Okay, so I, I have a like meeting to... starting. <laughs> so but... thank, thanks so much for your time. Oh, thank you very much. Think... And keep, keep on this excellent work. It's extremely important. Uh, and uh, I look forward to helping in any way. Thank you so much. Good. Thank Take you. Bye-bye, bye everybody. Bye-bye. Um, so Monica did uh, put the question, but we can we can save this then for, for the discussion later. So <laughs> gather this side. Um, that's, well, yeah, I think it's great that we would have another uh, intervention from Professor David Smith, who actually is uh, one of the 15 independent scientists who prepared the first global sustainable development report commissioned by back then uh, Ban Ki-moon, who was the, the UN Secretary General. So to David, I think I, you have the slide as well, right? Yeah, thank you. Yes, David. thank you very much. Can you see my slide? Uh, perfect, yes. 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 Great, excellent. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me and for congratulations on creating an extremely interesting index and uh, something which I hope will be adopted and move forward. Uh, I had, I thought it was interesting to talk about the issue of cross-cultural values and how um, our shared or not shared values might affect an index like this. Uh, the, the quote here is from a song which I know of by Black Uhuru called Solidarity. It was originally written by Stephen Van Zandt, but it talks about what people want. People want to work, they want to keep their children warm, everybody wants to you know, feel good about their family. And these, this is a sort of an attempt at sort of universal values, some of which might very well be relevant to the kind of index that we are talking about. But there's a couple of questions which I'd like us to think through. One has to do with whether or not values are universal and uh, what values might be universal. But also, if we're talking about an index, how do we go about assessing values? Whether we, are we able to universally assess those values which we might be thinking about? Uh, I, I think it's very important that you have objective and subjective uh, measures in the same index. And I, th I think it's important not just because you might say, some might say you should be one or the other, but I think that you learn a lot more from understanding not just the subjective, but what the subjective is about. So I tell my students, for example, let's not just look at the disaster and hear what people say if they say this was the worst flood we've seen in 30 years. But let's also check to see if it was in fact the most rainfall that ever fell in 30 years. And if it wasn't, we can learn even more about people's understanding and reaction to the flood than if we only looked at the objective, the rainfall, or we only looked at how people felt about it. The, the concerns I have would be that um, how do we collect enough data? So the World uh, Values Survey, uh, I think for wave seven, they say they're going to do seven, 57 countries. They'll do two small island developing states, uh, Puerto Rico and Singapore, but they're not typical of small island states. Puerto Rico is essentially a, a, a colony of the United States. Singapore is a, a kilometer and a half drive over the bridge to the Asian mainland. Uh, on the other hand, the earlier wave covered Trinidad and Tobago and Haiti, and, this is, and Haiti, of course, is in the paper that was presented by Wolfgang and his colleagues. I think it would be very useful to try and find ways of including the Pacific Islands. Uh, you will find, I suspect, different values and ways in which well-being might be expressed there. And at the moment, they, they are very much a gap. But I have a question. And I think Prof. Sachs touched on it very slightly when he mentioned that happiness scores in Latin America tend to be much higher than you might expect. My question is, does homicide affect satisfaction? If you look at murders per 100,000 in 2018 against the happiness ladder in that SDSN global happiness report, you, you see those points in the red oval those are countries which have extremely high murder rates, 
but they also have pretty high happiness scores. Now, it's not the case, if you look at that distribution, that all the countries with high happiness have low murder rate. The highest do, and then at the lowest, you also have happiness scores that are, you know, fairly low, but also low murder rate. Now, my, my question is, for something which is as vital and fundamental as homicide, why is it that you can have high happiness scores and high homicide at the same time. When we look at the satisfaction component of years of good life, and I only looked at a couple of things uh, pulling around, and this is not as attached to actually creating the number of years of good life. This is just looking at the component that relates specifically to satisfaction. You see that murders per 100,000 that are high are also in areas where we have a high satisfaction component of year, which will eventually contribute in some way to years of good life. And my question is, are there other components of an, of an objective reality which are equally bad or equally inimical to what we would think of as good life? that might end up scoring highly on subjective measures, even though we would say, yeah, that, that's, that's a completely bad and horrible thing. But the people who are there are saying, well, I'm, I'm reasonably happy. What does that say? Does it say that they're oblivious? Does it say they've learned to live with something? Does it, are, are there other explanations as well? And I think that, it's something we might want to think about in terms of how do we look at years of good life. The other point I wanted to make, and I think uh, Prof Sachs touched on it, would be um, this idea of cutting off, which I understand. And my question is, is there something we can use universally measure above just the minimum? Uh, examples were given in the paper about things like uh, flush toilets and whether or not people had flushed toilets in their homes as a sort of objective measure of being out of poverty, uh, which is good, but it occurred to me as well. I know places in, in the Caribbean and in other parts of uh, Latin America where it's better to have a pit latrine because of the water regime you're in, and that a flush toilet is a very bad thing because you don't get enough water, whereas a pit latrine is actually a much better solution to a low water regime for some places. Um, we, they, they, there's a talk about floors and wall construction. And my question is just, how do you determine the right measurements if you are outside of the country? Or do you have countries decide for themselves what might be the criteria for being out of poverty? And the other question then is, should it be graduated or should it be a cutoff? I think it's important to have a cutoff, but I am wondering, as well, what then happens after that is, I, I think of uh, populations of people which are above the poverty line, but may not necessarily be in a situation where they would be of what we would refer to as good life. And good life might vary an awful lot if we simply think of above the poverty line. So, is exceeding the minimum standard of a good life important? Yes, it is. But all good lives won't necessarily be the same across countries, even if the number of years is actually similar. The question then I had, does satisfaction take this into account? But I'm concerned in one sense because satisfaction can be high in situations which are objectively bad, or maybe it's subjectively bad. And many countries could have high levels of satisfaction, but objectively bad situation. Should there be another criterion added to measure how good the good years are, in addition to how many good years we have? Or is it that maybe we could uh, sort of just broaden the way in which we measure in order to figure out how good the good years are? And what I thought was it would be really interesting. Um, it's a great index, I think, and a very good opportunity to do some extremely good research at several different levels. I had jotted down um, that there's a uh, community that we're interested in working in 
in the southern western part of Jamaica, where we're trying to figure out if we can apply the global sustainable development report aspects to, of of measuring the goals to that. And it seems to me that it would be really interesting to apply this measure to that, that community and to see whether or not it could work in a, in a small community in a developing country. But we, I think it's also very important to look particularly at the small islands. And I, I say that unapologetically as somebody who lives in a small island developing state. But we should also look at landlocked developing countries and least developed countries, particularly to see how one can collect the data. And here we're talking about the actual mechanics of collecting the data, which I think is sometimes underestimated. Uh, we should try to find more universities to try the method in their countries. And also, it would be interesting to see what government statistical institutes are collecting vis-a-vis -vis what they necessarily share and also to identify maybe gaps and whether or not they have their own measures for what they consider to be good living conditions. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, David. You raised so many questions. I think in Europe, we took it for granted. I haven't thought about homicide and happiness. We just took it for granted that uh, it's maybe not such a big issue around here. But I was just wondering if uh, Wolfgang or some co-author would like to address some points straight away now that it's still fresh. Well, I'll just start and then maybe some others, but we can have the, the full discussion later on. Um, that, thank you so much, David. This was really very rich and lots of uh, inspirations for further improvement along that line. Um, you clearly pointed at some of the problems uh, of, of the life satisfaction alone, but that's precisely one of the reasons why we combine this with uh, a life table. Um, because in, more generally, uh, of course, murder, uh, if there are many people killed, this diminishes the life expectancy. So it, it comes in here. And more generally, I mean, what you, it is, you can always improve uh, the average well being of the surviving uh, if you somehow elim eliminate the unhappy or the poorer. Uh, for those surviving, uh, the average will be better. So, to rule that out, if we put this into sort of an optimization model in a, in a sort of a mathematical model, we really must have explicitly take the length of life into account. Others, you can always improve. Uh, well-being by by eliminating those with lower levels of well-being, and that's not what we want. I guess so. That's one of the reasons why I think that the uh, life expectancy and the length of life is so essential as the backbone of this indicator. But um, uh, yeah, others may want to add uh, some of the other authors. I think Vanessa said you you wrote in the chat you could add something. Oh, but I'm not an author. But please <laughs> just, go ahead. <laughs> I just made this comment because I'm with other colleagues and we are um, developing this paper that relates, uh, th that investigates the, the role of violence uh, globally, but also we saw that for particularly in Latin American countries, this was very connected to lifetime uncertainty. So when we contrasted um, the um, measures of happiness or other indicators, we saw this paradox that David uh, pointed out, but this was really connected to the idea of uh, how life is unpredictable. And this led, instead of a feeling of, of stress or feeling down, the opposite. So people were uh, more prone to higher risk behavior, to, to seek higher risk behavior, especially among, among younger individuals, because of this feeling of, well, we don't even know if there will be tomorrow. So it's just... Um, you know, uh, uh, connected to underlying violence, but as other, also this perspective of the lifespan inequality translated into uncertainty. So because you feel this uncertainty, this really uh, doesn't shift your view of happiness because they were happy as long as they were able to take this, uh, this type of behavior. Um, and because homicide rates are so high, it's like we, we can just die tomorrow. So let's just be be happy. So this is a bit of a, uh, some of the cultural puzzles that I think is interesting. And one thing that I added is that maybe I don't know how this would be possible with yoga. I think yes, because uh, if I'm not mistaken, you use Sullivan method, right, to develop it yeah. would be to maybe have a lifespan inequality yoga. So a yoga that reflects the 
distribution of lifespan inequality because though you have like um you are somehow reflecting the mortality experience but it could be interesting to see what would be the lifespan lifespan inequality satisfaction in the sense of for those individuals who don't get to survive you know what would be the average um mm -hmm. average lost so you could maybe translate it into the average um good life years lost you know um in, to compare the countries yeah something to still consider in the future yes if, if i may just would quick, quick of, please eric yeah <laughs> yes, yes. so uh, extremely interesting points by both uh, david and vanessa um i think a, a bit of a difference between uh, life, uh measuring lifespan inequality and uh and yogel inequality is that once you're dead you're dead but with yogel you can have a bad year this year and still next year you can be back in terms of having a good year, yeah? So that's a bit of a difference there. Uh, and uh, following up on David's comments, I also found this very, very interesting, what you what you showed us about the correlation uh, with, uh, with homicide rates, yeah? And it reminded me very much of uh, Durkheim's very early investigations on sort of society-specific patterns of suicide, yeah? Where he showed that in different societies, you have very different uh, systems of values leading to different patterns uh, of, of suicide. Yeah? In one society, it's one group of people driven by a specific set of values um, uh, committing suicide in a different society. It's a different kind uh, of uh, a different group of people doing that. And so I think similarly with homicide, we're going to have a lot of different societies with very different types of homicide regimes. Um, and uh, so it would be very interesting also to see which countries uh, those actually are that you showed us in this upper right corner uh, of your of your chart. But definitely very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, let's let's try to leave some time also for discussion. But I like to now hand over to Kat, who's going to wrap up. And Kat says she has a small presentation. I'm not going to time you, Kat. So go ahead and then you take <laughs> um, over also the discussion. <laughs> you might want to. No, no, no. It's okay. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to take over, um, and I'm going to what I have is a little bit of a presentation of questions that have come up in the chat and also questions that sort of have come up before in different areas where I've seen some of these ideas explored. And then also I'll talk a little bit about some of my own kind of, I'll start off actually talking about my own um, perspective and then go into the questions and sort of the summary of the, the different work that we've seen here. So hopefully that's going to be easy to follow. Um, it's only a few slides, so if you think that you might have questions, this is a great time to start preparing your questions because we'll definitely have time for the panelists to address questions. Well, I guess primarily um, the team, the author team of this, this paper to address questions at the end. So there'll be plenty of time, so don't worry about that. Okay, here we go. Okay, this is, whoops, one second. All right, okay, so this is, I'm Catherine Grace. I do, I'm a statistician, started off doing demography as a, as a math person, and then ended up going into statistics and formal demography and also geography. What I discovered in doing that kind of work, um, I primarily focus on women's experiences with health and uh, resource availability and those kinds of things. As a person who primarily used data collected from other people, uh, collected by other people from other people, I realized that my engagement with the communities was lacking and that the way that I understood these different mathematical processes needed to, uh, would be much enriched by spending time in the community. So I try to spend time in the communities where I do work and try to refine some of these measures that I'm using of wealth or those types of things. So that's a little bit about how I, I come to this kind of work. I primarily work in West Africa and I primarily work on questions of climate change, food insecurity, resource availability, and women's health. Now, one of the things that shows up in my work and also in the work here, as well as in some of the questions and feedback uh, that, we, that I got in the chat is questions about inequality. 
Um, also thinking about the processes that interact to create inequality and how these play out differently over space, in part because of cultural norms, um, different systems, and those types of things. So we this, this idea of how do we think about how people interact with each other um, and how do they interact with space uh, in terms of their environment, but also in terms of urban places interacting with rural places and different countries interacting with each other. So we have multiple layers of interaction that might generate different types of inequalities that we really want to think about when we're thinking about quality of life and when we're thinking about measurement. Um, so I will just, I have a little summary of what else is needed. This was something that, again, I'm kind of putting together during this, this presentation, so I don't have everyone's ideas mentioned here, but we definitely talked a little bit about multidimensional play-based measures, um, but also in that second presentation, we heard a little bit more about the past and the way uh, past experience might lead to current outcomes and how we want to think about that. Of course, I'm highlighting the inequality piece because when we aggregate from individuals to a country level, we really want to think about uh, who, who is shaping this measure or how is this aggregate measure being shaped by what's playing out at a much finer scale. Um, okay, so another way of thinking about that is that place and time matter. Social processes play out over space and time. Space shapes, I'm a geographer, so you're going to hear me talk about space quite a bit, but space shapes interactions. And what I mean by that was also like what was brought up in the, the previous presentation, um, that the way we measure things, toilets was the example, um, is going to, to matter differently in different places. Wealth matters differently in different places and certainly wealth and um, uh, ability or physical ability or disability are all going to come together in different places at different times. Um, this idea also came up about bringing those who are not yet born into the equation with regard to biodiversity. So as we start to think about using this measure uh, for sustainability and that type of thing, we, we probably do want to start thinking about um, the biodiversity components with the benefit to the people who are not yet born. Um, so other issues that came up too in the chat um, and also in the presentations are relationships between people. Um, so certainly we've seen this with COVID, how people take care of each other, how what the care environment is, um, how that shapes how we feel about ourselves and also about um, each other. This other question came up too in the chat. I didn't have time to update my slides um, to, to capture that. But yes, this question of, of sort of the context, safety, violence, power, um, political or economic instability, and certainly what you know would be really useful in this indicator as we think about imply, applying it empirically are uh, how do we wanna bring in fine scale changes in in weather, climate change, instability, land use, and how do we want to think about how those pieces interact with poverty um, and energy um, as two sort of main examples or food security as two relevant examples to the sustainability development goals. Um, so these are, again, kind of themes that came up in some of the questions, and I can read more specific details there too. Um, so some of the, the ideas that came up certainly in the readings is this idea of, and also in the, the most recent uh, panelist presentation, um, although not said in exactly these same words, but building an indicator from the bottom up. So what does it look like instead of just using uh, individual level data and aggregating it, but when we ask communities and individuals um, and activists for example, which factors matter at that place and time for a good life and thinking about how that process emerged. Um, what does a good life mean? That's another kind of, uh, uh, both Ann David Smith explored this too. Sorry, you didn't get your um, credit there just because I didn't have time. And then of course, one of the, the chats, the, some of the questions that came up in the chat Two are how to empirically engage with these measures and ideas uh, given our current data landscape. So we, uh, many of us use different types of fine scale individual level survey data, um, but are there ways to use that data and think about this years of good life, uh, ways to incorporate qualitative data or community-based information? Um, and how exactly are we going to start to in incorporate climate and environmental data, which I think must be considered in terms of inequality and also at different spatial scales. 
So that is kind of, so I'm leaving that kind of big question about empirical data, um, climate, and also this measurement question um, about good life out there too. And then I'll go back to some of the more specific questions in the chat. Well, the floor is open. <laughs> no. Yes, so yes. <laughs> Wolfgang and others, go ahead. I'm well, sure you've thought uh, about uh, all of this. One piece of information, uh, sort of what we've presented so far in this PNS article is, is really sort of, a proposed indicator on the table and the next step and that's actually happening this uh, year already we're going to have local focus groups in in different parts of the world we're going to have in three settings in nepal one urban two rural settings we're going to have in a rural community in costa rica we have in namibia and south africa some some local people focus groups testing uh, the dimensions of this indicator that is absolutely necessary i fully agree with you on this so the, the challenge here is we go from the macro macro type like the global modeling very stylized simple models to the very local how the people uh, in the field uh, view this and uh, and still trying to to get something common that can be used at both levels out of this that's the, the big challenge this was just an addition that we we do have this uh, component of testing it in the field as well Yes, I think sharing that, that's great to hear, and sharing some of the science aspects of linking this qualitative information or local quantitative information to help us to have this kind of back and forth between the aggregate measure and model and back to the, the more individual level place-based approach. I think there's quite a bit of science in there that a lot of us would be really excited to see and learn from as well. Um, so let me ask a question from Sam Sellers. Sam, do you want to ask this or do you want me to go ahead and do it? Doesn't matter. I'll oh, just go ahead, Catherine. Okay. So Sam asks, this is for Wolfgang, what thinking has been done regarding incorporating risk and uncertainty in years of good life um, in the measure? The conditions at time one that allow us to estimate years of good life may not persist through the entirety of one's life and the actual years of good life lived may be greater or less than the estimate derived. Well, I can start a bit and then maybe Eric, uh, who is the second author, can uh, sort of jump in. So if we, I mean, when calculating life expectancy from a demographic perspective, we either have the period approach, which is the more based on the mortality rates in, in one year, and then there is cohort life expectancy. Um, the must by far the most usual measure is period life expectancy, not least because for cohort life expectancy, you have to wait until the last member of that cohort has died, which may be above the age of 100 when sort of the child mortality is already a century ago. So it, it's really hard to have this cohort specific analysis. So that's why we, we opted for the period life table, which sort of summarizes the conditions. Uh, but by giving an uh, outlook, by giving a forecast of life expectancy, of course, we uh, we put in the, the long time dimension. And as I said, like while so far we have uh, reconstructed it and there's the empirical data um, for the recent past, uh, the next challenge really is to, to forecast as part of this Gupta has also said, that's sort of the, the heart of also the sustainability science approach is to try to look into the future and, and uh, somehow model this needs to be based on some um, scenarios as well as uh, very simple stylized models because we cannot have all the rich patterns of determination of future poverty of, of future health and of uh, future cognitive abilities and the most important clearly is to address a uh, future uh, life satisfaction from there we can only sort of estimate the determinants of life satisfaction in the past from empirical data and then uh, make assumptions uh, how these same relationships will hold in the future uh, following different scenarios and we probably as we do in this shared socioeconomic pathways we have to probably have bundles of scenarios that are some of them associated with bigger life satisfaction and others with smaller so this is um, sort of the, the analytical and, and modeling approach uh, that we have i'm not sure whether this fully answered the question but yes we, we are sort of forecasting uh, this uh, period indicator of years of good life and therefore generate trajectories over time. Thank you. I think, you know, hearing all these questions and reading them in the chat and thinking about my own, this ongoing piece of 
of really being able to play with the model at different scales, spatial and temporal scales will give people a lot of, uh, will enhance their understanding of how this, this indicator works and will allow them to kind of adapt it to their situation. So I think that that's an exciting opportunity. Um, there is a question in the chat from Monica Sigliano which is an, a question I think for everyone, certainly everyone here can participate, but definitely the panelists. Um, how do we get governments to move away from GDP growth as the main measure of success and towards measures like years of good life? Eric, you wanna say something on this? Well, um, I guess it's Chiliano, right? Um, so I think one uh, immediate response to that would be that uh, Yogle is probably not so um, immediately responsive to short-term changes, for example, in, uh, in, in, in the economic environment uh, or uh, other factors uh, having an impact on GDP per capita, for example. Yeah? So in Yogle, uh, you would really need much more drastic uh, social changes to really affect um, years of good life. Um, but we, we would certainly see something like the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, through its impact on life expectancy, but also other factors inside the yogal indicator to have an effect uh, on yoga quite quickly. Yeah. Um, besides that, um, I guess the biggest question, the biggest problem is with, uh, with measuring uh, the factors that yoga requires, that the calculation of yoga requires. Yeah. It's really difficult to get those uh, dimensions uh, that we that we want to capture with the yogal indicator um, consistently within one survey about one sample of people uh, there is hardly um, a survey in the world as as of now that really collects all that information that we would need uh, for yoga yeah and so i think to answer your question one major step forward would be to first of all start collecting data consistently on a on a yeah uh, on one group of people uh, within one survey uh, so as to calculate the yoga indicator from that. If I can just add a little, I mean, the, why is it not used, uh, these indicators? Why is GDP per capita still used by all governments? And one of the parts, there are many answers to this, but one is that it is just such a simple number. You have just one number and somehow it is also, it's not right, but it has sort of the impression this is sort of the amount of money that people have in their pocket. It's something that people can relate to. And uh, all these multidimensional poverty indices or these better life indices or whatever you have, they are all highly sophisticated, differentiated. They have, um, and they are not just a simple number. Many of them are just abstract numbers, uh, whatever, 0 0.897 or so. What does this mean? And that uh, was one of the last criterion, if you remember, that it would be nice to have a real life analogy. And that could be the case with yoga. Like there are so many years of good life in this subpopulation. And you can really do it like for women from this ethnic group and, and so on. And then at the end of our PNAS article, we even sort of think about the future. Maybe at some point when people try to assess, let's say the cost of climate change or what the, they usually at the end, you find some euro or dollar numbers. Why couldn't that be the cost in terms of years of good life lost? Another an equally powerful, straightforward number uh, than euros. And, uh, um, and so the, such a simple indicator may be a prerequisite for being more frequently used by governments. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and certainly if we have more buy-in by governments, then we can have more uh, support for collecting survey data. <laughs> That, that are useful for, I mean, it's a little bit of a complicated challenge to get anyone to change how they're doing things. I always appreciate the use of anecdotes and stories to help drive points home as I find that we think numbers are so important, but actually when we end up telling the stories about how these things play out in real life, that can be super compelling. So we can think about that. Um, there's another question too that came up and this I think will probably uh, kind of wind it up with questions. So if anyone has additional questions, there will be a PERN cyber, uh, you'll be able to engage with this material 
um, over email and and the, as the, as a community and pose different questions as they come up. So um, so you'll have additional time besides what we're doing here. Um, so stay tuned for that. The final question um, that we have time for is more of a comment, uh, but really thinking about the utility of this measure in a context of climate change. And I mean, that the, the idea is, you know, it's already changing so quickly, things have already changed quite a bit. Um, is there, you know, making an indicator, developing an indicator that doesn't explicitly consider climate change vulnerabilities and risk um, maybe seems, seems like we need to actually be considering that now, given what we know. Um, so how, do, how are you seeing that? How is the authorship team, the developers, seeing the incorporation of climate change at different scales into this indicator? How do you envision that? Yeah, you want to start, Eric, because this you maybe also uh, go to this um, SSP um, uh, disaster death paper that we had in, in science. Um, yeah, well, I think uh, that is really something that still remains to be investigated. Yeah, to so how exactly and to what extent uh, would changes in the environment, a loss of biodiversity, uh, environmental quality, the loss of ecosystem services that are essential for um, for maintaining a certain quality of life, how would that actually uh, affect human well-being in, in quantitative terms? Yeah, I think that is really something that that still remains to be studied, and uh, I think. This this is also what those focus groups uh, that Wolfgang uh, alluded to earlier um, are going to be uh, crucial for. So there we very much also hope to find out more uh, also of that qualitative evidence uh, that you, Catherine, um, spoke about just earlier uh, that would tell us that would give us some more information on how exactly and to what extent uh, people are actually affected by those environmental changes in their quality of life in different parts of the world. Yeah. If I just may add that, that the way we are uh, going ahead uh, is uh, sort of two different strategies. The one is aiming at, at, at very simplified so-called stylized models of um, nonlinear interactions, such as the, the Wonderland model you may have heard of what uh, sort of we had the other the series of population development environment interaction model. They are not fully blown uh, integrated assessment bottom with all the spatial details because this is not doable, but I just show uh, in, a, in a sort of stylized way how uh, uh, changes in the uh, environmental quality and the natural capital declines may feed uh, back to uh, each of the longevity, to the, the poverty and the health, as well as uh, on the subjective well being. So that's one way. And the other uh, is uh, sort of developing scenarios. Uh, in the tradition of these shared socioeconomic pathways, these SSP scenarios that are sort of bundles of assumptions of uh, economic change, social change, and environmental change, and also see how what are sort of the, the yoga trajectories that correspond with these uh, different set of possible future scenarios. Uh, that's of course, and then I do some space uh, location specific applications on these uh, case study sites. That's our strategy for the remaining duration of the project. Well, thank you. You have an audience who's excited to read what you all come up with next. And of course, give you lots of feedback about ways you could do it even better based on our own research. You know, we always have advice. So um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists. Um, thank you, audience. Thank you for a very engaged discussion. I think most of us could probably continue discussing this for months, years. So I really appreciate uh, the participation of everyone here. And as always, it's truly lovely to spend an hour and a half um, in this conversation with all of you. So thank you so much. A big round of applause to the organizing committee too and all the work that they did to make this happen. And please keep your eyes on the, the emails about this um, and the, the reading materials that you can respond to. Maybe you should, should people still yeah. need to register for the Pern Cyber Seminar if they have not done yet, because some of them just had the link. So maybe you uh, can reiterate that you have to register in order to be part of the email. Thank you. Thanks for that reminder, for sure. Please register. You can see the link in the chat. Um, and follow up with any questions, you can definitely send them to me. If you forget everyone else's name and I will get them to the right team. So thank you so much, everyone. 
Um, thank you, thank you.